Jerry. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Byron, director of the UWA Institute of International Relations, and it's a great pleasure Sorry. to welcome mm -hmm. all of you, members of our UWA. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Byron, director of the UWA Institute of International Relations, and it's a great pleasure Sorry. to welcome mm -hmm. all of you, members of our UWA. Good afternoon, everyone. Jessica Byron, Director of the UWA Institute of International Relations. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you, uh, members of our UE community and our alumni, our many external stakeholders, and especially our distinguished speaker, Dr. Kusha Haraksing, to our first public lecture for academic year 2020 to 2021. This is a very special event First, because of the significant theme of Dr. Harraksing's lecture. It's entitled The Revised Georgetown Agreement and the Reconfiguration of the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific Group, the ACP Group. The lecture is extremely topical and timely. We are living through major shifts in the global political economy and South-South relations have assumed even greater importance for Trinidad and Tobago and the entire Caribbean region as we try to navigate the new existential challenges that we face during this time of COVID-19 pandemic and of course other changes that we are living through. So let me give you one example of where the ACP and South-South cooperation fit into the new scenario. Prime Minister Motley of Barbados, the previous chair of CARICOM, announced in July that the CARICOM countries were being provided access to the African platform for medical supplies, which would guarantee security of supplies and stability of costs for protective equipment, other equipment and medications associated with COVID-19. Access to the facility was supported by the World Health Organization and by African leaders, among them Kenya and South Africa of the ACP. This is just one small example of the value of building and maintaining ACP networks of cooperation and reciprocal support. Today's event has added significance. It is our very first totally online public lecture. We are revamping our modus operandi to continue offering you, our valued clientele, our engagement and analytical perspectives in the new environment that has been brought by the pandemic. It has provided us with the opportunity to have much greater outreach and to provide you with more access to our services in line with the UWI's AAA strategy of access, agility, and alignment. During the rest of October and November, the IIR will be staging three more online events, so please stay tuned and listen out for our announcements. Dr. Harak Singh, thank you very much indeed for your interest in doing this lecture and for launching the 2020-2021 series of public events for us. You are a very long-standing friend and academic associate of the IIR, and you have always shared your rich experience, your vision, and your fine intellectual analysis with our staff and students. I extend a very warm welcome to you and now I call on Dr. Michelle Scobie to introduce you properly to our audience. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon, Professor Byron. Good afternoon, Dr. Harak Singh. And good afternoon to everyone joining us virtually uh, at this really important seminar. 
I'm so pleased to, to introduce Dr. Harak Singh. We go back a long time. In fact, it was at one of his special seminars that I discovered my research topic that led me eventually to the PhD. So it's sort of almost one of the reasons why I'm here today. So thank you for that public, public gratitude. Dr. Harak Singh, there's so much to say about him. He is a former Senator of the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. He is also an international consultant providing services to many uh, international organizations, including, for example, UNCTAD, ILO, FAO, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the ACP Secretariat, the CARICOM Secretariat, the Caribbean Basin Initiative Group, and the International Lawyers and Economists Against Poverty. You know? He's also a member of UNCTAD's research partnership platform. And of course, he was engaged by the ACP as a legal consultant for the revision of the Georgetown Agreement. He is also a, now currently an honorary consultant in the Office of the Vice Chancellor at the University of the West Indies, a former chair of the University Standing Committee on Ordinances and Regulations and advisor on pension matters. I just have like about four more pages to go, but I'll try to summarize now. He is a graduate of the London School of Oriental and African Studies, a barrister of Lincoln's Inn, and an attorney at law. He's also been the chairman of the Institute of African and Asian Studies, the head of the Department of History, founding dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. And he is a fellow, we are proud to say, of the Institute of International Relations, where for many years he's conducted a specialized seminar on negotiating one's way in the world. Of course, Dr. Harak Singh has had several publications on law in plural societies, on labor, and on law and trade. He was also a visiting scholar at the University of Michigan, an Arbor visiting fellow at the Center for Caribbean Studies, University of Warwick, and a senior Fulbright Fellow at Harvard University. And these are just some of the things that are perhaps most relevant in terms of his talk today. And I would like to join uh, Professor Byron and the rest of the IR community in thank thanking Dr. Harak Singh for all that he's done over the years for academia and for the policy world. And uh, I am pleased to um, welcome him and to thank him for the talk that he's going to give this afternoon. Thank you. Ms. Scobie, Dr. Harak Singh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Scobie, for that uh, generous introduction. And thank you to uh, Professor Byron and the Institute for hosting this particular event. Today, I want to do three things. I want to look at some elements of procedure then I will look at substantive changes in the new Georgetown Agreement. And finally, I'd look at some implications of the new agreement. But first, a disclosure and a prelude. The disclosure comes from the fact, as mentioned by Dr. Scobie, that I was engaged by the ACP Secretariat for the revision of the Georgetown Agreement. So I'm not exactly neutral in relation to these matters. I am particularly pleased, however, that at the very first meeting of the ACP Council of Ministers, following the conclusion of the treaty, there was a reference to the reinvigoration of the ACP by the chairman of that meeting. So it would seem that there is some impetus that has been added since the conclusion of the treaty to the work of the ACP states. And I'm very happy about that. I want to... Uh, uh, notice the presence if he's here. I can't see exactly who's online. Of His Excellency Ambassador Patrick Gomes, who was very instrumental in some of the events which I will describe in today's talk. So, so much for the disclosure. As for the prelude, that is best expressed in the uh, recollections of Sir Sridhar Ramphal in his book called Glimpses of uh, globalized life. It is uh, a little bit more than glimpse. It, is, it reads in some places like a uh, Hollywood uh, drama. He describes the original fortuitous meeting of non-aligned world, uh, 
as he put it, on the banks of the Demerara River in 1972, which led to uh, a long train of events culminating in the ACP countries speaking in a single voice at the conclusion of the Lome negotiations, and then a determination to continue that coordination going forward, eventually resulting in 1975 in the first treaty of Georgetown, the Georgetown Agreement, which some people described as the constitu constitution of the ACP. This prelude then is, uh, could be enlarged by students looking at Sir Sridhar's autobiography and his reminiscences. Uh, as I say, it's almost a blow by blow account of the founding of the ACP. This determination to continue to work in solidarity is uh, an important part of the ACP experience. And just at the outset, I can perhaps mention the agreement of the 79 countries of the ACP a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago, to support one candidate, the uh, candidate from the Federal Republic of Nigeria for the position of Director General of the WTO. These are 79 countries having gotten together in order to support one nomination for this very important post. It's just an example of what can in fact be achieved by solidarity and coordination. So as I said, I will do three things. I would look first at procedure, then I would look at substantive changes, and finally, I'd look at some of the implications of this treaty. The question of process or procedure. The discussions uh, at the ACP level over the years have uh, signaled a determination to make the ACP more relevant to today's circumstances. Mm -hmm. Professor Byron in her brief remarks have, has mentioned some of the considerations leading in that direction. The discussions uh, culminated in uh, an agreement that the Georgetown document should be revisited in order to attune the ACP countries more to the realities of the modern world. And following a series of discussions and decisions, the Committee of Ambassadors in Brussels was enshrined with the task of revisiting the Georgetown Agreement. In order to carry their work forward, they established an editorial committee. And it's perhaps uh, useful to reflect a little bit on that terminology, the editorial committee for the revision of the Georgetown Agreement, because it does indicate some kind of limitation of the ambition that was uh, in a way solidified at that time. An editorial committee was not expected to make drastic changes in the document, but as time went on, it became clear that what was happening was a little bit more than a revision and the creation of a qualitatively different organization, which might become obvious as we continue with the talk. But limiting ambition is extremely important as a matter of process when we have 79 countries and when consensus is an important uh, element. In order to have a new agreement, consensus must be achieved. And to have 79 countries agreeing on one document is, uh, is a, a bit of a challenge and a challenge that could be solved if one is not over ambitious in what one seeks to do. Uh, the other point is that the original Georgetown Agreement in Article 30 had provided for revisions or amendments as it was called. So it was possible to continue this new exercise under the aegis of that old agreement, which in a way solved some of the uh, uh, fears that some of the countries might have had that they were embarking on something that was a step too far. So consensus was important, building consensus was important in the process. And I'm happy to say that I was able to play some part in this because I've had a long exposure and experience with ACP matters, going back to negotiations for the commodity protocols. I was 
a spokesman for the Sugar Association of the Caribbean, and then going into the negotiations for the EPA, where even though the various regions of the ACP went their several ways, there was great opportunity to coordinate and share information and so on. So I was not an unknown quantity. And over the last 10 years, I had been working as chairman of the CARICOM Competition Commission, and in so doing, interacting with similar organizations in the ACP world, as well as those countries which were in the process of establishing their own competition commissions. So I wasn't surprised when one of the delegates to the ambassadorial committee in Brussels uh, said I was like the go-to person for the ACP, but I did regard it as a little bit of diplomatic hyperbole. Though, it, to be fair, and this is a point made by Sushirat in his book, the personal contact, the personal experience, the ability to establish links personally is an important part of the process for these kinds of developments. And we might as well note now that given what has happened, like for example, this virtual lecture, given what is likely to happen in a post COVID world, the opportunities for that kind of personal contact might be recalibrated. And we might indeed be on the verge of determining a new kind of regime of diplomatic interaction in the post COVID world, which might be important for students here in the diplomatic academy. Maybe they might be uh, instrumental in devising a new kind of platform for carrying forward work of this kind. So consensus and trust was important. It's also important as a matter of process to try to leave out for the moment the very uh, the, the matters that could appear to be contentious or could become contentious. So as is the case in a number of these kinds of international instruments, there is an inbuilt agenda referring to matters that are left aside for the moment and which might be revisited at a later stage. Some of this has to do with questions of uh, rules of procedure. Some has to do with uh, organizational instruments that might be determined after the event to come into being. But one of the most important things in my experience in trying to carry a process like this forward is paradoxically to look at the preamble to the agreement and to try to get agreement on that preamble as a first step. This is because in some views, the preamble is not that important. Um, it's like a kind of uh, fluff, some people say, and therefore it's easy to get agreement on the preamble. My own, uh, my own position is very different, however, and I did, um, I did describe it in a briefing note which I prepared for the ACP uh, editorial committee. I said to them, <clears throat> preambles generally fall into two categories. Those concluded more or less as an afterthought, which is the old practice, and those actively negotiated between the parties, which I call the modern approach. This modern approach has gained prominence because the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties expressly lays down the approach to treaty interpretation in Article 31 and identifies the preamble as part of the context to be considered in the interpretation of the substantive clauses of the treaty or agreement. This approach has been confirmed by the jurisprudence of the ICJ, the WTO, and international arbitral tribunals. Moreover, the guidance provided by a properly constructed preamble is of increased importance the larger the number of parties and also where there may be more than one official language text. This is because in those circumstances, there may be greater and even deliberate ambiguity in the agreed text. In an environment where disputes are likely to be resolved politically rather than legally, the importance of the preamble is not diminished because of the framework parameters which it establishes and which is less nebulous than a bland reference to the spirit of the agreement. So my approach was to try to get agreement on the preamble first. And, and once that has happened, then a kind of straight jacket has been produced. It makes possible the aims and objectives of the treaty to be more easily discussed and ascertained and it makes possible some of the substantive provisions in the treaty going forward 
to be determined because it can all be referred back to this original instrument which would be contained in the preamble. So, so much then for the procedure. If we can move on now to what I call some of the substantive changes in the agreement. Of course, the text of the agreement is available to everybody. It's um, online and the text is uh, in English and in many other languages, in English and French. Um, so it can in fact be referred to. Uh, the first thing I will notice in terms of the substantive changes in the new agreement is of course the designation. The uh, ACP was known as the ACP group of countries and now it is known as the organization of ACP states. Um, it might seem that this is not so much a big change but I can quote from one of the first uh, briefing notes I wrote. I wrote to the, uh, to the Committee of Ambassadors in which I said that my, in my opinion, the word group is a little too informal for what was being considered as a major instrument now. And I thought that that word should be revisited. I'm happy to say that that suggestion found favor. And now we have a new designation, the organization of ACP states. And uh, the ACP secretariat did send out a notice which says, please be advised that effective 5th April, 2020, as per the provisions of the revised Georgetown agreement, the African, Caribbean and Pacific group of states will henceforth be known as the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. So I think that gives it a little more gravitas and makes it a little more easier for it to be understood as, as an international organization in its own right, desirous and ambitious of playing a larger role in the world stage. Now, the next important part of the sub substance that I will speak about has to do with the new obligations which are uh, undertaken in this agreement. And the new obligations have something to do <clears throat> with spreading the wings of the, of the organization, so to speak, so that it emerges from behind, as it were, the cloak of its origins, which was the relationship between the ACP and Europe. This is captured in the old Georgetown Agreement, which says in the second recital on the preamble, having regard to the ACP EC Lome Convention, that's the second reference in the old Georgetown Agreement. In the new agreement, this is relegated to the ninth recital. So the idea is to move the OACP, as it's now called, the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States away from its original moorings and to spread it so that it stands by itself as an organization with a life of its own independent of its relationship with Europe. This is not of course minimizing, so to speak, the relationship with Europe or excising it altogether, but noticing the ambition of the group to stand as it were on its own footing. So that I think is an important part of the new obligations which have been undertaken in this agreement, which can be, uh, can be uh, referred to by going through the agreement point by point. <coughs> Another important part of the new agreement which changes its character has to do with membership. The ACP was interested in providing a framework for new countries to join this institution if they so wish. So whereas originally the membership was confined to ACP states on the basis of geographical regions and these regions were specified, now the new agreement says in article two the OACPS shall be organized on the basis of geographical regions and then the regions are listed. 
and its, it adds, or any other configuration agreed to by the summit. So this means that countries outside of the traditional grouping of ACP countries can in fact be accommodated in this organization. Now the full ramifications of that um, would have to be worked out. In fact, it might indeed have uh, uh, some kind of meaning uh, or some kind of significance for the name of the organization itself. If, uh, if a new state were to join, that was not part of the traditional grouping. But I thought it was important to mention this because it does indicate the determination of the OACP to play a larger role in world affairs and to strengthen its links with non-traditional areas or with areas with which it has not heretofore been so close. Now, the other important qualitative difference in this agreement has to do with the fact that for the first time, there are sanctions included in the agreement for non-compliance. There were no sanctions in the old Georgetown agreement, which led many people to suggest that that agreement was not binding in itself. But there is a distinction between being binding and having sanctions. In fact, the old Georgetown agreement, in my view, was indeed binding because it is a treaty. And like all treaties under the Vienna Convention, they are binding. It's just that there were no sanctions for non-compliance. This new agreement imposes sanctions. The sanctions are, however, calibrated. There are sanctions to be imposed for breach of the agreement, but the sanctions are so worded and so uh, calibrated that they are supposed to be uh, sanctions that come after consultation and after giving the party in breach every possible opportunity to repair the breach and also um, imposing conditions that do not destroy the spirit of the agreement. So the exact um, working out of how the sanctions will be applied um, are yet to be fully determined and will be determined by new rules of procedure, which are part of the unfinished agenda of this agreement. The agreement also uh, has in place a provision for dispute settlement between the parties, which did not exist in the old agreement. The rules for the dispute settlement process are yet to be determined, but there is agreement that there should be a dispute settlement process. And that's uh, included in the agreement under Article 33, Dispute Settlement. Now, one thing to, to notice, which is an important um, characteristic of agreements like these, is that there is always a provision for appeal. And in this case, the appeal is directly to the heads of state. And furthermore, the heads of state are supposed to arrive at any decision by consensus. So one can imagine an offending state or a state in breach applying to take advantage of the appeal procedure, um, which is a procedure to be determined by the heads of state, including the head of the offending state. So there may be uh, a little conundrum that would have to be worked out in resolving matters of this kind. But nevertheless, there was a determination that a dispute settlement mechanism should be established in this agreement, and the rules of procedure for that have to be determined. This agreement also provides for the establishment of a trust fund, a trust and endowment fund, and this is new. And it's part of the determination of the ACP countries to stand by themselves. Now, it is true that over the years, they have depended quite a lot on financial support uh, 
from the EU and still depends to some extent on that support. In fact, uh, there is a, a slight problem with that uh, support at the moment. And even as we speak about a reinvigorated ACP, there are questions and concerns about the financial uh, strength of the organization. But the idea of establishing a trust fund is in order for the ACP to garner additional sources of financing or alternative sources of financing from those to which it was accustomed to look. It is uh, too early to say how this trust fund will work out. I know in, in one of my um, other capacities, I was aware that, for example, the Caribbean Court of Justice established a trust fund, and it was supposed to be of such an order that the, the court could work on the dividends that such a trust fund would produce. But everybody knows what has happened to interest rates over the last couple of years, and funds of this kind um, are not producing the returns that one would have envisaged when they were established. But nevertheless, there is a, an attempt here, and this attempt is important because it resists criticism from others that the ACP is only uh, interested in living on handouts from others and is not uh, committed to taking its own steps to put its own financial house in order. There are some other new elements in the agreement, but these are for housekeeping nature. They have to do with the role of certain organizations, and they have to do with the structure of, uh, of certain committees and certain bodies in the organization. In particular, it should be noted that the Secretary General of the organization is now described as the Chief Executive Officer, and there are certain new kinds of powers and obligations which he has. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when these negotiations were going on, it would be true to say that more than one delegation came to the conclusion that what was happening was a little bit more than a mere revision. And this did raise questions about accession to the agreement, uh, whether or not um, a process of ratification was necessary, whether or not the ambassadors themselves could have signed on on the new agreement as the old George Strong agreement envisaged, or whether there would have to be more inputs from capitals. In the end, a process of ratification for those countries who required ratification was accepted. And I think uh, it was agreed, it, no, I think I know it was agreed, that the agreement would come into force provided a sufficient number of countries, and the number was stated, had established and deposited the instruments of ratification. So the agreement came into force. This um, awareness that this was more than a revision and imposing new obligations and uh, a new structure, so to speak, for the organization is what uh, I would describe as by saying that the new agreement is qualitatively different from the old one and produces an organization that is more suited for the modern world. Which takes me then to the question of ramifications. One important ramification I've already mentioned in passing, which is the agreement by the countries to support a candidate, unified support for a candidate for the WTO. And, uh, there are other kinds of um, initiatives which have happened over the last couple of weeks. For example, the celebration of World Cotton Day, an agreement by the whole of the OACPS to celebrate World Cotton Day, which is, uh, in, a, in some respects, a kind of throwback to the days of a, a concern with the commodity protocols. But there are some important, other important ramifications. If I have to summarize it, I would say that what we would be involved in going forward is negotiating the whole concept of development. <clears throat> Many of the instruments that ACP countries are engaged in, uh, 
in terms of negotiations with others, has as their bulwark and grounding the question of sustainable development of ACP countries. And one then is involved at many different kinds of forums in negotiating this process of development. Here in the Caribbean, in our own EPA and in the forestalled at the moment, Canada negotiations with CARICOM, there are important chapters on development and how one negotiates development cooperation. And it's important that we explore the full ramifications of this and look at how countries who are similarly circumstanced are approaching this question of negotiating development. A second important uh, qualification arises from, a uh, second important ramification arises from a reference in the new preamble to the ACP working together to avoid, as it is stated in the preamble, to avoid the application of unilateral coercive measures to the member states of the OACPS, including those measures with extraterritorial effects. Now we could think, for example, about the EU blacklisting of certain countries in terms of their financial uh, um, organizations and in terms of their, their financial rules and regulations. And as you can see from this preamble, there is scope for the OACP countries acting together in trying to arrive at a common front in relation to some of these kinds of disciplines which stem from extraterritorial sources, um, which have, as we have I highlighted here, uh, the quality of being a unilateral coercive measure. We didn't exactly uh, come that way um, recently in Trinidad with, with uh, a dispute over the application of what was called the Rio Treaty which I would not go into, except to say that if one looks at the preamble to that treaty, one would see that it has to do with extra territorial interference. And therefore it's arguable that it cannot be applied to relations within the hemisphere, but that's a different matter, which I will not uh, explore at the moment. There are two other things that are very important to my mind, uh, which are now included in the new treaty, which did not exist in the old one. And this is the question of climate change and the full ramifications of good governance. Now, this notion of good governance, when it first emerged in the Cotonou Partnership Agreement was a troublesome uh, concept. It seemed to indicate that there were some things which were peculiar to Europe, which we in the ACP should now embrace. But as was made clear at that time, the time of the conclusion of the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, good governance is a work in progress. And that is the, it's something that people will aspire to over time. There are some guideposts that one can establish, but one couldn't say that any particular country had in fact achieved all of the rudiments of good governance at any given time. This means that there is scope now for what is what I would call moral suasion, as could happen, for example, though it was more than moral, in the case of Mali recently, and some people might say it could have happened in the case of Guyana or Georgetown recently, which was um, uh, an important point because the word Georgetown um, over the last six months was seen in a different context from the, the Georgetown Agreement. So moral suasion, I think, might be an important ramification. So in this uh, talk so far, I've said I would look at three things. I would look at procedure, at substantive changes, and at some of the implications of this new agreement. And um, I'm now happy to, uh, Professor Byron, to undertake uh, to answer any comments or questions that members of the audience might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Harak Singh. Well, there are two questions so far. So that's a good way to start. Uh, there is a question from 
uh, Dr. Anthony Gonzalez. What are new areas where the Organization of Africa, Caribbean and Pacific States is hoping to have an impact? And does the organizational change add real value? Tough question. And there is a, shall I give the second one as well? There is a second question coming from one of our students, Alyssa Ali. What has the OACP done to help countries with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic? So those are, those are two to start off with. Question of organizational change, does it add real value? <clears throat> the problem with huge organizations like the OACPS, which is 79 states, is that streamlining it is not an easy matter. So that even when one makes changes, one can see scope for further changes. And as I said at the beginning, one has to go or limit one's ambition in order to achieve the required level of consensus. Um, the answer to the question of whether it will make any difference is that time will tell, we will see um, whether it does make a difference. There is a, a streamlining of the secretariat. There is, uh, as I said, the new designation for the secretary general as a CEO, which is intended to give him a little more elbow room in trying to organize the affairs of the Secretariat. There are implied in the agreement as work, further work to be done, several new instruments to be established, one of which is a intergovernmental, um, it's called the IROC, and it's a conglomeration of uh, academics and diplomats and experts meeting together probably once a year in order to try to drive the ambition of the OACP forward. So in answer to, uh, to you, Dr. Gonzalez, I will say time will tell whether this new organizational structure will add value. Now is however not a good time to make the assessment because as we know, because of the effects of COVID-19, and because of the financial stringency with which the organization is now faced, the, uh, the judgment as to whether a new organizational structure will in fact produce the results that's anticipated for it, um, that judgment now may not be the best time to make it. As for the new areas, well, there are some things which did not exist at the time of the original Georgetown agreement, or even if they existed, they were not in fact um, at the front of people's attention. I did mention climate change, for example, um, COVID-19 or epidemics is another one, obviously. The WTO did not exist at the time of the old Georgetown agreement. Um, no, for example, was a question of um, the full ramifications of what was meant by sustainable development. These things did not, did not exist. So the new agreement allows us to delve more deeply into these areas that I would call new areas that did not exist. As for the question of COVID-19, I don't have an answer to that. I really don't know what the con various countries have done together. I rather suspect that um, most countries are de uh, busy dealing internally with their own problems. Um, for countries that have a border, this of course is, a, is an issue. I mean, here in Trinidad, we don't exactly have a, a land border, but we have a sea border with Venezuela. And as you know, questions about that have arisen. But countries that have a land border that is kind of permeable so that people can move from one place to the other might need to adopt a unified approach to how one deals with COVID-19. But I really don't have an answer as to what the OECP countries as a whole have done on that question. Thank you. 
the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, so I'm going to field three more questions to you. And then I have another three coming up after that. All very interesting and exciting questions. Uh, question number three is from Dr. Scobie. Could you surmise on why the first agreement lacked dispute settlement and sanctions within the agreement? Um, should I give you the other two? Uh, Dr. Gonzalez has a second question. How secure is an ACP commitment to an ACP WTO candidate? And he recalls that this has happened before, but it did not hold in the wider politics. And <laughs> he has a last question for you. Is there any new thrust in intra-ACP cooperation and is it backed by resources? Of course, one could always point to the, the health platform that I mentioned a bit earlier in that respect. So um, I'll let you deal with those. And then there are three more questions coming up after that. Is there a new trust backed by resources? <clears throat> I think in... Um, in answering questions like these, we have to be a little careful about the pot calling the kettle black, so to speak, though that might not be a proper uh, imagery in these days. But I had in mind, for example, what happens within CARICOM. As, uh, as I said in my um, lecture, I was chairman for many years, 11 years, of the CARICOM Competition Commission. There was a great determination that the virtues of competition should uh, be made uh, known and, and that the benefits of competition should devolve on to ordinary people. But was it backed by resources? The answer to that is no. Um, there are many, many times when the, the competition commission, like a lot of CARICOM institutions, like indeed, the one that I was closely associated with for 40 years, the university, um, had to plead for the resources to carry out its work. So on the one hand, yes, there's a new trust. On the other hand, there's always this question of resources. And it would indeed be ideal and very helpful if, as it were, people put their money where their mouth is and the resources uh, do, in fact, come forward. Um, so all, can, all, all I can say to that, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, is hope springs eternal um, in the human breast. And, and one hopes that the resources, which are in a way always committed, would in fact be visible or would be made visible following their commitments. The second question was the H ACB commitment to a WTO, single WTO candidate. Well, I can only go by the pronouncements that people have made, and I'm not in a position to doubt the sincerity of their pronouncements. But if you go to the ACP website, you will see that they are saying, they all say together, that we have uh, determined that we will support the candidature of the Federal Republic of Nigeria for this position. And if that indeed were to realize itself, bearing in mind that we are talking about 79 countries already committed to one person, then that will probably go a long way towards determining who the eventual uh, successor to the WTO Director General would be. The first question was from Dr. Scobie about the original Georgetown Agreement and why it lacked sanctions and a provision for dispute settlement. I would say to that that um, it does remind me of the original point I made about limited ambition. It was clear to me that in 1972 and later on in 1975, the countries could only go so far as they were willing to go in the sense that one wanted to carry all along and not to leave behind anyone that might have raised objections to any particular uh, provision. I could see how uh, sanctions would have raised objections in those days, in the 1970s. Uh, 
Um, so it was perhaps wise that it was omitted in um, the light of an attempt to try to secure the widest possible consensus. I think that would be the answer to that question. But of course, if, um, if one delves into the recollections of uh, Sashridat in his uh, fairly voluminous book, one might have uh, some further insights as to why the group did not go as far as uh, might have been thought um, necessary at that time. Thank you very much, Dr. Harak Singh. Um, another three questions. Um, I think three seems to be working quite well. Uh, there are two questions from Dr. Indira Rampasad. First is, does the trust fund suggest that the OACP is going to bear the full brunt of costs? And second, on the question of sanctions, does breach of good governance now incur sanctions? And the last one, and this is a, this is a fascinating question from Dr. Karen Niles. How do you think the OACPS would respond to a request from donor countries to join the organization as members? As an example, some donor countries are members of the Pacific Islands Forum. What guarantee is there that the OACPS will remain a South-South organization? countries who are anxious to extend their muscle. But if we look at the agreement itself in terms of membership, um, the agreement, as I, I think I've, I read it out, it does not prohibit in chapter, article two is called establishment and article, Mem the article on membership, sorry, that says it's not exactly restricted to the traditional OACP countries, but any new entrant would have to abide by the obligations in this treaty. And secondly, they, their entry has to be by consensus of the summit. So, it is for the conglomerate as a whole to determine whether they will accept any new country into the agreement. So let's just say the agreement is permissive. It allows it to happen, but whether it will actually happen faces this uh, hurdle of whether the existing members will say yes to such, and by consensus that is, will say yes to such a, a new step. As far as breach of good governance, um, being capable of exciting sanctions, the problem here is that good governance is not a definite uh, phrase in terms of content. It is a flexible phrase. There are some things uh, that you can say breaches the principles of good governance. And you can in fact talk, for example, about let's say the rule of law or respect for democratic institutions. But even those things like respect for the rule of law is not as straightforward or simple as it seems. Um, just to take an example, in the last event that we had following the Ghana elections, both sides said they were committed to the rule of law and were following the rule of law. 
uh, one side in terms of uh, calling for uh, a rapid determination of the results of the election, and the other side waiting for the courts to determine it. And both sides saying that they were following the rule of law. So while it might be true that certain elements of good governance could in fact lead to the determination that a party is in breach, exactly how that breach will be described and established may not be as easy as it seems. There may be some uh, obvious breaches that may come under the heading of good governance for which there may not be a dispute. For example, let's say genocide or atrocities of certain kinds. Um, those might be open and shut cases, but generally speaking, um, other elements of good governance might be regarded, as I said in my talk, as a kind of process or work in, in progress, and therefore not easily judged as to whether somebody has at any given moment breached the principles of good governance. With respect to the trust fund and whether it will <laughs> be so determined to meet the full brunt of the cost, um, the answer to that is outstanding. I don't think that the ACP um, envisages that it would not be in receipt of donor funds. And this is why the reference to the trust fund is expressly described as additional means of funding, as opposed to the only means of funding. So I'm, I don't think there's any acceptance at the moment that the ACP should by itself meet the full cost of its uh, operations. Dr. Harak Singh, the questions keep on coming thick and fast. <laughs> um, right. So, question nine. Um, this is this question nine is from Dr. Gonzalez. Has the location of a new headquarters been decided? And if not, what chances do the Caribbean stand? And question 10. Is Cuba a part of the new OACPS? And let me put one more into that batch. Uh, this is a very popular topic, as you'll see. This question comes from Joel Richards. In light of the rise of China and India, do you think the ACP or the OACPS should have similar cooperation agreements akin to the Cotonou with these countries. Uh, those okay? You want me? Mm -hmm. China and India. Well, that's, this is an important question because the OACP countries <clears throat> are ideally positioned to understand the uh, structure of the world. I think uh, Sridhar Ramphal, when he uh, was speaking about that original meeting on the banks, as he put it, of the Damara River <clears throat> in 1972, a meeting of non-aligned ministers, um, said it was a happy coincidence that Damarara was equidistant between the Pacific on the one side and um, and the Atlantic. Well, I don't know how um, equidistant, uh, the world is a circle, so equidistant is um, kind of difficult concept to, to figure out. It's like what happened when um, migrants from Indonesia, Muslims from Indonesia went to Suriname and had to determine in which direction they would face when they were praying to Mecca and the community, as some of you might know, uh, split into two, the Easterners and the Westerners. One saying we had to face one direction and the other, that the world is round, so you face the other direction. So um, yes, the point I was making is that 
here's Africa at the center, so to speak, of or close to, to Africa, uh, close to China and India. There are historical antecedents of um, movements between these places at a time when New York did not exist, when the center of gravity of the world was a line between Delhi and, and Beijing, or Peking, as it was sometimes called. So to, to come back to that, uh, to a, an appreciation of that situation is in my mind very important. And yes, the agreement does provide a possibility of the OACP uh, establishing these kinds of links with other groupings. Having said that, it is true that many individual countries have established their own, uh, their own links and sometimes um, sometimes facing some kinds of criticism or some kinds of concerns about how far reaching these links might be. This is especially the case with China and some concern about debt trap or, or whether or not the, um, the muscle that might be extended might not be all too helpful. So yes, there, there is uh, certainly scope for, for an engagement with the emerging power, well, the powers, China and India. Um, the other question was about the headquarters. Um, <clears throat> the new agreement does in fact say directly that the headquarters may be moved to a place to be determined by the summit. <laughs> So, so it does not um, it does not indicate that the headquarters should remain in Brussels. In fact, there is some discussion at the moment. I think the old headquarters building is being um, renovated. I don't know whether or not a time will come when people might decide to move it outside of of Brussels itself, outside of Europe. Let's just say that the new agreement is permissive. And it says it can move to another place if the summit so decides. Um, there was a question about Cuba's membership. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was just uh, looking through the uh, the list of people who acceded to this new agreement, and Cuba, of course, does not exist in this list. So it's not a signatory to the new agreement. Yeah. I have one more question at the moment. And um, that question is again from Dr. Gonzalez. How does the Caribbean see its interests in the OACPS? That's a good question. I mean, it's coming home. Um, how do we look at the rest of the world? Um, I think I haven't really discussed this with um, with ministers of government or with people who might have a view on it. But I think um, on first principles, it would be fair to say that there is a variety of perspectives. There are some who think that this is just a club, it's not that important, it's uh, maybe a little um, uh, amorphous to deliver uh, real hard and fast uh, products. <clears throat> there are others who think that for the Caribbean it's extremely important because here we are in the shadows, so to speak, of the United States and uh, we need links outside we need um, we need some kind of counterbalance and uh, force, or some kind of counterbalancing framework, as we approach some of these very troubling questions of uh, terrorism, of uh, security, um, or even of development, and what passes as development. I remember. Um, in a totally different context, a remark attributed to uh, the Prime Minister of India after independence, Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, 
when he had to comment on the question <clears throat> of whether India becoming independent should remain a member of the, as it was then, the British Commonwealth. And I think his, his answer was, well, if you are in a club, you don't really want to leave the club unless there is a good reason. There may be certain benefits to being in the club, provided it can be configured to meet some of your uh, concerns. So for example, the British Commonwealth became the Commonwealth. India became a republic, but was still able to stay in it. So the thing about it is that there's a view that if you have friends, you might as well remain among your group of friends. Um, but as I say, there may be some some view views that uh, the ACP is not really a very useful organization uh, to which to belong. But in the last part of my talk, I spoke of the ramifications of, of the new agreement and suggesting that there is a great value in uh, the Caribbean's participation in the OACPS. After all, the OACPS was um, persuaded to keep the word Georgetown in this revised Georgetown agreement, which I think um, was significant and important. You have been most kind, and I'd like to impose on your kindness for a couple of final questions. There is one from Anthony Gafur. To what extent should developmental issues be tied to addressing human rights? And I think that Dr. LaGuardia has two questions. She is present in the room with us, so she can ask them from her mic. Yeah, okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very comprehensive and update uh, conference. I believe that we are really, really appreciative of your time and, and information you have shared. I have two questions. Uh, one is touching with a question that doc Dr. Gonzalez already did, and it is a question and maybe a little bit of a concern in terms of what do you believe could be the real impact of the organization of, of the ACPs in a world that has so many different types of organization today? Which are the areas that you believe there is a better chance for this organization to have an impact and an influence in multilateral negotiations and multilateral fora? And, and the second question has to do with the relation of the organization with non-independent territories. How do you believe that my where? What is the room they can have in, within the organization? <clears throat> yeah, if I can do deal with the last part. This question did in fact come up during the negotiations, and that is the relationship with the non-independent territories. And there was a big debate about whether there should be associate members, whether there could be observers, and so on. The agreement does provide for the possibility of observers, and it does provide for a calibration of, uh, of uh, participation. In other words, the sharing of information, sharing of non-confidential information, uh, being allowed to attend meetings and so on. Um, so there is scope for um, engagement, for agreement with countries that are not independent. Um, with respect to the areas that I think this organization can make an impact as opposed to other organizations that exist. Uh, they have a variety, as you rightly say, of organizations. Sometimes it's kind of interlocking concentric circles that people belong to. I would uh, emphasize sustainable development and all the subheadings of sustainable development because the countries that belong to the OACP, they have as their guiding principle the sustainable development of their countries and of their people. So effectively, this would be matters like poverty eradication, some elements of gender sensitivity, uh, dealing with women and the youth, some elements of uh, environmental uh, protection, uh, especially with relation to the sea, but also with relation to water, uh, which is a big issue, especially for many countries in the South, um, 
some of these areas I think are important areas where this group, because the countries have more or less uh, the same concerns, can add a unified voice to the meeting these challenges. For example, if you take desertification and water, um, the fact that a lot of these countries share the same borders, as I was saying, and the problem yes, uh, transgresses individual territories, it might make it easier and more, I suppose, powerful for a group like this that's united in relation to some of these issues to uh, make their voice heard. The question on human rights and its relationship to um, development. The OACP countries are very strong on this. I mean, in the, in the preamble, which we eventually determined, this is the third element of the preamble. It says, reaffirming their commitment to adherence to fundamental human rights defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, particularly with regard to compliance with democratic principles, the rule of law, the right to development, as well as the right to self-determination. So in the same paragraph, there is a reference to human rights and the right to development. And this was deliberate because as the rest of the preamble sometimes suggests, you cannot have real development unless at the same time you have respect for these human rights. Yes, um, thank you very much, Dr. Harak Singh. Um, there is one last question that I really don't think you would want to not to answer. It's from His Excellency Dr. P. I. Gomes. Does the revised agreement give scope for civil society organizations to be formally affiliated with the OACPS, such as trade unions and women's organizations? And, you know, this question was in my head, and I'm so glad that it has been asked. Yeah. Yeah. Who are uh, sort of familiar with the cotton negotiations, um, the CPA, uh, they would recall that the European Union made a big, uh, big play for the inclusion of civil society. Um, and in the CARIFORUM EU Economic Partnership Agreement, we also have recognized a role for civil society. This uh, particular agreement talks about that in uh, institutions like, for example, the IROC, the uh, regional organization, organizations, inter-regional organizations committee, which is to be composed of people from civil society. And it is expected that that meeting will take place maybe once a year and civil society universities, trade unions and so on will be invited to play a big role in, in that organization, hopefully to feed into the uh, the formal organizations, the other formal organizations of the OACPS. So to answer, I would say yes, the agreement does envisage a role for civil society in uh, in its modern um, determine in its in modern. Um, I suppose I, w I was going to say the new agreement as a modern creature in this modern creature. A role for civil society. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Harak Singh. I think we can all agree that you've been extremely generous with us this afternoon in answering over 15 questions. Uh, it shows the interest in the topic because the questions have been coming thick and fast all along. So it is quarter past two. And uh, colleagues, if you all do not mind, I'm going to end the question and answer session at this point. I think we've had a good innings. And I would like to call on Claudia John, one of our master's students. Welcome, Claudia. And thank you very much for joining us to give the vote of thanks this afternoon. <laughs>
present, good afternoon, Director of the Institute of International Relations, Professor Byron, guest speaker, Dr. Kisha Harak Singh, other distinguished guests, the Secretariat staff of the Institute of International Relations, other staff and students of the Institute of International Relations, staff and students of the UWI. It is my privilege to have been asked to move a vote of thanks for this lecture. On behalf of the Institute of International Relations, I would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Dr. Harak Singh for sharing your time and presenting your work with the viewers today. I wish to thank you for your very insightful and meaningful intervention on the revised the Georgetown Agreement and the reconfiguration of the ACP group. I found this lecture to be very interesting and I think that we all have gained a deeper understanding. I also extend thanks to the Secretariat staff and students for their planning and coordination of this event and the students for their participation in this lecture. The management of the agenda as well as the quality of the presenter were particularly noteworthy. Professor Byron, your well-executed moderating lent for a coherent and smooth virtual lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I want to say that we are all grateful to Dr. Harak Singh. We thank you for being with us in this virtual lecture. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you once more for your continued commitment to knowledge sharing in the interest of our region. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to add my own thanks and um, good wishes for the rest of the day to everybody who has been with us this afternoon. And we look forward to meeting with you again one week from now when we will be having our next public uh, event, a diplomatic dialogue delivered by His Excellency Dr. Patrick Gomes, former Secretary General of the, uh, the Africa-Caribbean Pacific group at that time before it, yes. And uh, so that will be next week, Monday, and the publicity should be going out very shortly. And we hope to welcome all of you back to that event also. So thank you very much, Dr. Harak Singh. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.